Welcome to today's service. Let's open in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to come to worship together, Lord. Lord, just be with us as we sing, as we go into your word, Lord, as we listen to a message. Lord, we just pray for everyone who watches this, Lord, that they may be blessed and encouraged. In your name we pray. Amen. So thank you for watching this with us today.
Psalm 16. Keep me safe, O God, for in you I take refuge. I said to the Lord, You are my God. Apart from you, I have no good thing. As for the saints who are in this land, they are the glorious ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrow of those will increase who run after other gods. I will not pour out the libations of blood or take up their names on my lips. Lord, you have assigned me my portion and my cup. You have made my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is in my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure, because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at my right hand. 
That was Psalm 60. Thank you to my wonderful children for their lovely singing today. You may have noticed we were one child short. That's because our eldest daughter, Sierra, had her wisdom teeth out yesterday. So she's over the house right now just trying to recuperate. Uh, now it's my turn and let's go into uh, God's word. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this opportunity just to delve into your word, Lord, just to wrap up the book of Ruth today. Lord, just open our hearts. Lord, be with our minds. Lord, be with my tongue as I present your word. In your name we pray. Amen. One of my favorite times when I was growing up as a kid was haying time, especially before my grandparents sold their farm. It was a time when the whole family came together to my grandparents, all the aunts, uncles, cousins, everyone got together and we did the help. We helped my grandfather with his haying. You know, it was a lot of hard work, but it was also a lot of fun. You know, it was a time when, you know, we would just get together and just have just a great time of hanging out and hard work. You know, there was even kind of a rite of passage for the grandchildren. It was if we were strong enough to you know, lift a bale by ourselves. Sadly, my grandparents sold the farm before I was able to lift a bale. I was only eight years old when they sold it, but I still remember those times uh, with so much, so much fondness. And part of that reason was because of the hard work, the fun, you know, the, the goofing off. And, you know, a lot of times at the end of the day when we were done, and especially when we were actually finished uh, the hay, we'd have, you know, just a great big potluck meal. Everyone would come together and the food was wonderful. And it was just a great time of celebration. You know, later, uh, a few years after my grandparents sold the farm, my aunt and uncle kind of started haying, so we started helping them out. And it was the same kind of thing. You know, that when haying time came to get all the hay off of the fields, we did the same thing. You know, it was hard work, it was a lot of fun. By that time, I was able to lift bales by myself, and it was great. And the same thing, the food was always good, the company was always good. It was just a great time uh, together as a family. Now, in today's passage in Ruth, we actually have a similar setting, a similar, a similar situation, because it's harvest time. The time, it's the, sorry, I should say not the harvest time, because that's where it began. It's the end of harvest. You know, the, the, all the grain, the barley has been brought in, and now they're threshing, they're piling, they're just getting into the last little bit of it. It's a time of celebration. But it's also a time where Naomi feels that Ruth should be moving on. Ruth, I shouldn't say moving on, that's not quite the word, right word. It's a time where she feels Ruth should make her move because Naomi was now responsible for Ruth and she thought, you know what, it's time for Ruth to get a family. You know, that things have been blossoming between her and Boaz and it was time to make something of it. You know, during this time of celebration when things are great. So Naomi tells Ruth what to do and her instructions we're pretty simple. Tonight, he will be willowing, willowing, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> the barley on the threshing floor. Wash and perfume yourself. Put on your best clothes. Then go down to the threshing floor, but do not let him know that you are there until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, know the place where he is lying, and then go uncover his feet and lay down with him. Now, from our modern perspective, that may seem a little strange, it kind of kind of weird. And some people, you know, they kind of try and make it provocative, saying, "Oh, well, that's you know, there's there's intercourse going on there. They're they're misbehaving. They're doing stuff they shouldn't be." But that's not really the case because when you actually read it, the situation plays out very much like Naomi said it would. Um, and if it was something more that, you know, something pro provocative, something that, you know, maybe we're kind of, oh, we shouldn't hear about. The responses from Boaz and from Ruth and everything that goes on doesn't really match up with that. And besides the fact that if there was something going on, the Bible would have called it because the Bible makes, it <laughs> doesn't hash it out. It, you know, doesn't try to hide the fact when people are having a affairs or, you know, doing the stuff that they shouldn't be doing. The Bible calls them on it. So in this situation, the Bible doesn't. So we assume it happens just the way it is. That, you know, the night comes, Naomi goes to, or sorry, Ruth goes to where Boaz is, uncovers his feet, and then, you know, they talk. And basically what Ruth says is, hey, you're my kinsman redeemer. <laughs> Redeem me, kind of as it were. You know, it, it's kind of a, a weird romantic um, 
situation or proposal, as it were. And like I said, to our frame of mind today, it seems very strange, very awkward. But in that day and age, especially when you deal, you look at the responses of everyone involved, it actually plays out pretty normal. So, yeah, like I said, it's kind of strange for us, but for them, it totally worked. Now, in this situation, one of the really neat things is that Boaz is overwhelmed by Ruth's actions. And one of the things that he's really overwhelmed with, and through the whole course of their relationship over the harvest season, is that Ruth doesn't go after younger men. You know, Ruth is herself a little bit younger. We don't know the exact age, but we definitely know that Boaz is older. And Boaz is, you know, thinks in his mind, well, I'm too old. You know, Ruth should be off chasing younger men her own age. But instead, she just attached herself to him. She fell in love with him. And Boaz is so overwhelmed by that. So, you know, he agrees to be the kinsman redeemer. But he brings in a little bit of a snag. There's a little bit of an issue here. While Boaz is a kinsman redeemer, there's actually another kinsman redeemer who is closer, a closer relative to Naomi and her family. So he has first right. So Boaz tells Ruth, you know what, there's one other person, but you know what, we'll deal with it. I'll look into it and I'll deal with it tomorrow and we'll make sure it gets done. And you know what, if he wants to redeem the field and if he wants to marry him, well, that's the way it's got to be. But if not, I will definitely marry him. And with that, they kind of part ways. You know, actually, I shouldn't say they part ways. After this discussion, Boaz tells Naomi, sorry, not Naomi, I keep doing that, tells Ruth just to stay there the night, you know, stay laying out at his feet because, you know, if she got up and left in the middle of the night, that would cause rumor, that would cause speculation, that would cause gossip. But they're staying there that night like that. It's just like she was another servant, just doing what she had been doing this whole time. And in the morning, when they go and part ways, before he, before Ruth leaves, Boaz gives her another bunch of barley, enough for another week's worth of food. I mean, once again, this just shows the generosity and also the love that Boaz has for Ruth. With that, Ruth goes back to her place, back to where she's staying with Naomi, and Boaz takes off to do what he said he was going to do. Now, Naomi, when Ruth comes home, she's like, so what happened? You know, it's kind of one of those things. I mean, I imagine, you know, a lot of uh, women and even guys and whatnot, you know, when that, that time for the proposal, the marriage comes up, everyone's like, so what did they say? What, what's going to happen? And that's kind of what Naomi does here, though it's kind of said in a little more straight-laced, dull fashion. But you can sure there was, there sure was some excitement in her voice. I'm sure of that. And you know what? Naomi says, you know, tells her what happens. And Ruth, sorry, did it again. Ruth tells Naomi all that happened and she's excited and Naomi's excited now and she knows, you know what, Boaz is a man of his word. Boaz is a man of action. And that's what we've seen through the story. And she's like, you know what, Ruth, Boaz will see this done today. So with that, we have that little bit of excitement there. And then the story switches back to Boaz. Boaz goes back to Bethlehem. He goes to the city gate. He gathers 10 elders together of the city. That's kind of how they make big official decisions, how they make important transactions. After he has those elders at the city gate as witnesses, he makes sure, I guess, kind of how the story says, the other kinsman redeemer who is unnamed, he comes out from the city. Boaz grabs him and says, hey, so, I'm paraphrasing, of course. Naomi's back. She has these fields. She needs to sell them. You're the kinsman redeemer. Do you want to sell them? And at first, the guy's like, yeah, sure. I'll buy the fields. You know, everyone can use more fields and it keeps it within the family. He knows his role. But then Boaz launches a little surprise. Oh, by the way, there's the widowess Ruth that you have to marry as well. And with that, the other kinsman redeemer is like, no, I, I can't. I'll endanger my own estate, my own children, my own dependents, my own inheritance if I take that on. You know, some people kind of look at that and they're like, oh, that man is so bad, it's so ungodly. But I don't really think so. I mean, I think he was just a man. We don't know what the situation was. Maybe he was stretched as far as he could. Maybe he already was married. Maybe he already had kids. Maybe he didn't have kids. We don't know the situation. And the Bible doesn't condemn him. The Bible just simply says he was unable to do it. And you know what? That happens in life. You know, we all have times where a great opportunity may come along, but we can't act on it. And we have to let it go, even though it may make sense for us. Maybe it feels like it's the right thing. But if you don't have the money, you don't have the money. And that was the situation. So with that, 
Boaz says, okay, I'll do it. I want to marry uh, Ruth. I want to buy the land as well. So they have the economic trans uh, agreement. <laughs> I just forgot the word there. Oh, it's a great day for that. And they sell the property. Boaz is now the owner of Naomi and Orpah's and Ruth's fields that had belonged to their husbands, all of that property, and Boaz marries Ruth. So it's a time of celebration. It's a time of joy for all of them. And everyone knows it, and everyone is excited. And that seems like kind of the end of the story. You know, it's a happily ever after. But the story keeps going on. The story kind of now jumps forward to, well, at least nine months, and a baby is born. And everyone is very excited about this. Actually, sorry, I should back up. Before the baby is born, I just looked at my notes. I, I got a little too excited, a little too into the story. After the deal is done, the elders of the city, the elders of Bethlehem, they get together and they bless Boaz, which is kind of a, a similar thing. It's like kind of, we wish you luck kind of today. Well, in there... You know, the elders of Bethlehem, they start saying, you know, may you be like this great guy and this great guy and have lots of children and da, 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 da. G very generic blessings. But in there, there's one name that isn't uh, a well-known name, isn't a very generic name, isn't one of the famous patriarchs, and it's Perez. Now, Perez one of, was actually one of Boaz's forefathers many years earlier, many generations before this. But you wonder, why is he put in there? Because he's not one of the famous ones. Well, I think, and a lot of scholars think the reason that he is put in there is because Perez was actually the son of a kinsman redeemer situation himself. You know, and he became one of the heads of the families of Judah. So it was really kind of interesting, I think, that the elders recognized this situation that this is a kinsman redeemer, that this is a great possibility for the situation. So they look back into their own history to a, sim, a situation that was similar to that, and they use that as a blessing for Boaz, just saying, hey, you know what? God helped us in the past. God helped this family that's in the same situation as you. May you turn out, may you be blessed, just like that family. And that was a very exciting thing. One of the other really interesting notes about this and you actually see it when you read in the genealogies, especially other genealogies, that Perez is similar because the woman involved also was not a Jew. She was a Gentile, just like Ruth. Ruth wasn't a Gentile. Ruth was also a Moabite. So once again, we have those similarities in the stories. So once again, it just kind of opens it up, and it's kind of God showing a little bit that, yes, the nation of Israel was his and was precious to him, and, you know, outside was all the Gentiles. But you know what? God still had a heart. God still brought in the Gentiles. The Gentiles still were important in God's plan. And that was something to be remembered. Okay, now we jump to nine months later. Nine months later, a little baby is born. This is how the chapter ends. The book ends as well. And the baby's name is Obed. And it kind of doesn't really focus on that too much, you know, that there's a baby and you think that the focus now would be on, you know, mom and dad, oh, um, Boaz and Ruth and little Obed. But that's not the focus of the story. The focus is, the end of the story is actually on Naomi. It's actually on grandma and Obed. And in here, it's the same kind of thing. The ladies of the town, they come together, they bless her, they're excited with her, all that kind of stuff. You know, and there's rejoicing. And I think it's important because how did the story start when Naomi came back to Bethlehem? Don't call me Naomi, call me Mara because life is bitter and God has taken everything away from me. And now the story ends with her rejoicing because now she has you know, a grandson. Now she has someone to carry on the line. Now she has someone that brings joy to her life. And I think one of the really significant things here, but one of the blessings that the, the ladies say to her is that Ruth is better than se seven sons. Now, I talk about that, we look at that, I'm like, oh, okay, that's kind of cool. But back in that day, that would be, you know, mind-blowing of a blessing. That would be the hugest compliment possible because in that day and age, and a lot of agricultural societies even today, you know, sons, 
And I'm not saying this disrespectfully, this is how societies viewed it. Sons were more important than daughters because sons inherited land, son could do the work where a, wife, uh, a daughter couldn't. So the fact that they were saying Ruth was better than a son, and in fact that Ruth was better than seven sons, which was the number seven for the Hebrews is very important because it's the sign of completion, the sign of perfection. So she, she is better than seven sons. You know, the complete deal, the, the whole, the greatness, Ruth is even better than that to Naomi because of what she had done and the joy that she brings into her life. And with that, we kind of close off the book of Ruth. And like I said, it's a great book. And I have mentioned this a few times throughout the series. I think it's a great book because it's a book of everyday life, everyday struggles. You know, we may not all be farmers, but we all understand what it's like to, you know, just live day by day and go to work. And you know what? We fall in love and we do all these kind of things. This is a book out of the Bible, especially out of the Old Testament, that we can relate to the most because of the situation, because it's everyday life. We see people struggle, we see them fall in love, and we see great things happen. And I think that's a great reminder to us. Because we look at our life, and we look at our situation, and we say, you know what? Yeah, I just live every day, and it's insignificant. There's nothing important going on in my life, and all of this kind of stuff. And my life doesn't matter, but at the same time, you know, because you think, well, I'm not a world leader, or I'm not a famous this person, or I'm not a multimillionaire, and I don't make big decisions, so I don't matter. But yet, we have the same thing here. Boaz and Ruth, they were nobodies as well, in a way. You know, but yet their story was important enough for God to include it in the Bible. And one of the other things that I've talked about, you know, especially when I mentioned in the first message on uh, the book of Ruth, was that it was part of... The book of Ruth is part of two stories. The first story was, it was during the time of Judges. So that was the bigger story it was part of. You know, and just to show that, and I think this is also a good important lesson for us today, an encouragement for us, that the book of Judges we talked about was a horrible time. It was a brutal time. It was a time of chaos where everyone did what was right in their own eyes. But yet in here, during that time of chaos, we still have a normal life. We still have people living godly lives, carrying on and continuing. And I think that's a great reminder for us today, right? Because we turn on the news, we read the newspaper, whatever it is, and we see the chaos in our world, you know, whether it's, it's COVID, whether it's the economy, whether it's the world situation, you know, all the stuff that's going on. And we think, oh, the world is so bad. Everything's so horrible. But yet, you know, and everyone's turned away from God. But yet, we can be like Boaz and Ruth. Right? We can still live our lives. We can still affect. God can still bless us and we still carry on. I think that's a great encouragement that in spite of you know, the greater story, the, the world around you being in chaos and being in an ungodly place, you can still live your life and be blessed by God and bless others and live a good life. I think that's a great encouragement. The other story that is that Ruth is a bigger part of only comes at the end and it's only in the genealogies. The genealogy is, says who Boaz is, you know, who his, full, who his full, full fathers, forefathers are, but it also talks about Obed, and it also talks about Obed's children and grandchildren. Well, in here, who's the important person? I mean, of course, it's Obed and, and Boaz, but the grandson of Obed is none other than King David, you know, probably the top three most famous people in the Old Testament. The, probably the greatest king in Israel's history that everyone looked back to, you know, is used as a standard of godliness and greatness and power for all the Jewish people, and that's Obed's grandson. So once again, we look at a normal life, we look at a small, insignificant story, and we don't think much of it, but then we see further on how important this story is, how important this meeting is, because if Ruth hadn't fallen in love with Boaz, if they hadn't had little Obed, if God hadn't been there through that time working that story, King David ne never would have been born. Now, for, for some of us today, we would say, well, that's great, but that's Jewish history. That's, you know, thousands of years ago. Why does it affect me? Well, because when you go to the New Testament, you go into the genealogies, who was the forefather, or who was their descendants? Their descendants was Jesus, right? 
That's why this story is important to us today. Like I said, it's important because it encourages us, shows God's involved in everyday life, but it's important to us because we see the genealogy of Jesus. We see God was involved in history this whole time. God was planning it out. And like I mentioned earlier, one of the things that's really important in this, especially when you read Matthew's genealogy, Matthew goes through, you know, most genealogies in that day just record men. You know, the father was this, father, son, father, son, father, son. But Matthew's genealogy of Jesus records three women. The women that we talk about today. Uh, sorry, two of them we talk about today. We talk about Perez's mother and we talk about Ruth. Once again, this is a reminder. These were Gentile. These were ladies of... Um, questionable character at times maybe too or at least from outsiders especially because they were gentiles and yet god incorporates them into the story and incorporates them into the most important lineage of all into jesus's lineage showing once again that god's plan wasn't just for the jews wasn't just for the sacred wasn't just for the holy that he brought everybody in and had everybody a part of this and i think that's so Important to remember that God loves everyone, God accepts everyone, and God brings everyone in. You know, the book of Ruth is a story about everyday life, everyday people, and it's a reminder that great things can come from ordinary people, ordinary situations in our life. That God can use any one of us at any time. And sometimes we may not even know it. I mean, I because I'm sure, you know, Ruth and Naomi and all of them and Obed. And Boaz, they had no idea who was going to come from them. They had no idea what the situation was going to go, how they were going to bless not just the Jewish people, but the entire world through their generations, through their, their sons and grandsons and so on and so forth. I'm sure they had no idea as they just went through their life. And the same for us today, right? We don't know the things that God can do through us, how he can use us to bless other people, to help other people. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for this message. We thank you for this time. And Lord, I just pray that you'll be with each one of us. And Lord, I thank you for the book of Ruth, the encouragement it is, Lord. Lord, just how you can use ordinary situations, ordinary people in your divine story, in your divine plans. In your name we pray, amen. With that, we end off the book of Ruth, and also we end off our service. So once again, thank you very much for watching. Have yourselves a wonderful day.